Hey guys, welcome back to the studio. Today we're going to take a look at Studio One again. And this is kind of a continuation of the first video I did about the CPU spiking. And the only reason I'm making this video is because I found something that uh, basically fixed the yo-yoing up and down of the CPU meter um, without using the dropout protection like we showed last time. The new PC that I built last December um, was having blue screen issues ever since I put the thing together and it was very random the machine would just crash for various reasons I mean I would just be doing nothing it would crash I would it wasn't repeatable it would just seem sometimes I could I could do a sequence and it would make it crash and then I start it back up I try to repeat it and it won't crash so there was a lot of trial and error, a lot of frustration, guys, a lot. I've been on Mac computers now for 20 years, and I can't support Apple anymore. used to be it was worth it. You got a quality piece of hardware, you got a great operating system, and the OS X experience, which, you know, when you, when you get used to OS X, it is a great operating system. I'll, I'll give it that. I, I do like working in, in that environment. Coming back to Windows now, uh, man, I mean, I'm loving it. I gotta say I'm loving it now that I fixed my machine. So I was having all these blue screens um, and causing my computer to shut down. And the message that I got on the blue screen indicated a hardware problem. So it was saying that I had some kind of hardware problem. That was, that's what was causing the computer to crash. So I started looking at my components, you know, is it the memory, is it the CPU, is it the motherboard, is it a hard drive, is it, you know, whatever, is it a UAD card, could have been anything, Thunderbolt. Well, I tested the memory, it wasn't the memory. I got a new video card, just, you know, I didn't have to get a new one, I got a new one because first I wanted to test it, uh, second is I wanted a better video card just for video editing. Uh, at the time I built the machine, I wasn't planning on doing videos. So now that I'm doing videos, it's nice to have a, a little better card. Nothing crazy, but it's better than what I had. So in doing the research um, and trying to find the hardware problem, uh, I was unable to find anything wrong with any of the parts. I'm not going to go into the specs of the computer or anything in this video. I'm going to make a video showing my computer. That's my next one I'm working on right after this one. So I'll show you all the parts I used and what it, how it came out and the performance and all that good stuff in the next video. Okay. <laughs> Drugs are bad. Okay. But I found it on YouTube. Um, and a guy was talking about, uh, oddly enough, Adobe Premiere. He was getting blue screens just trying to start the program. Uh, it would crash sometimes, but not all the time. So I was just, again, confused. Uh, and thinking, well, maybe, you know, how could a piece of software take down the hardware? It didn't make any sense. So in all my research, I found one guy talking about this program that's installed on your computer um, by Intel. And it's called, we'll take a look at it, Intel Turbo Boost Max Technology. Sounds like the greatest thing ever, right? Woo! It's going to make my computer faster, okay? I have a 14-core machine. I can make it fast on my own. So what this thing does, if you look at the screen here, it, it gives you a frequency boost, right? I mean, you could read all about this stuff if you want, but I wanted to get the name right because you want to remove it. You have to delete that stuff. Go into, go into here go into your apps here and then it's going to come up you know on the list here and you want to go ahead and uninstall it and it'll be down here by the eyes if you have it I'm not going to have it and look isn't that freaking crazy it's back again it's back uninstall again you want to go in there and make sure that thing is gone. Uh, as you can see, it came back again on its own. I don't know how this, this thing's like it won't die. It wants to be there. 
Um, but we don't want it. And I can tell it's not running because of this right here, this CPU meter. So when I had that thing enabled, it was causing the blue screens for sure. And then it was also causing this crazy CPU spiking in all of the DAWs. Not just Studio One, by the way. This is across the board on all the ones I tried it. So Cubase, um, Studio One, Ableton Live, Bitwig. Okay, those are the ones I tried it on. And across the board, it fixes the yo-yoing up and down of the processor. Let's find out what this piece of software actually does. And turns out what it does is it raises the voltage on your fastest cores. So when you have a multi-core machine, you have some of the cores are going to run faster than the others. It's just the way it is. So it takes those faster cores, right? There's like two, I think in this processor, they give you two that are like super cores or whatever. They're really fast. It takes those ones... And then it shoots a voltage spike to them to ramp those up so that your single core performance will go up. Sounds great, doesn't it? But what's happening is we're so dependent on CPU power with these DAWs. We can't have the processor speed, the clock speed, changing all the time. You don't want it going faster, slower, faster, slower. That's bad. That's going to cause this to move. Because it doesn't know how to deal with that, you know. Is it is it 2.7 or is it 4.8? I mean, it confuses it. Well, when this voltage spike happens, it sends too much voltage because these chips are very sensitive to voltage changes, okay? Sends too much too high of a voltage, the chip goes into protection mode, shuts the machine down. When I had the Intel turbo boost installed that I couldn't overclock my machine and I should be able to overclock this machine it's water cooled and everything else I, I should be able to to at least give it some boost every time I tried to overclock it was worse you know it was that Intel uh, turbo was just killing just killing my machine I didn't know it at the time but I come back to studio one and look what's happening this thing's not moving at all. It's just sitting there. Well, that's never happened. It's always moved. It's always yo-yoed up and down. And that's the creativity killer, as one person told me. Um, they're struggling with. It's just killing their creativity. So um, this should be the fix, guys. If you have, uh, if you have that Intel Turbo Boost, what's it called? Intel Turbo Boost Max technology. Get rid of that stuff. Uninstall it. Go into the BIOS. Disable it in the BIOS. While you're at it, get rid of Turbo. Get rid of anything that affects the speed of your processor. Yeah, so you're going to have that Turbo mode. You're going to have speed stepping. You're going to have all this stuff that changes the way that your CPU or changes the clock speed of your CPU. You want that clock speed to stay the same. There's also a setting called sync all cores. You want to sync all your cores together so that nothing moves. If we look at this, here's my clocks. All my clocks are synchronized together and they don't move. This minimum and maximum it was because I, that's I was during uh, I was trying some different overclocking earlier. Now if I play this, that's gonna stay there. See, it's gonna stays at four gigahertz no matter what. It doesn't move. It doesn't try to. It doesn't take this fast core and try to boost it up. Okay, we're not doing that. Look at my temps, 43 degrees, guys. And I'm loading this pretty hard. Now once all this polyphony goes down, you'll see the meter come back down. Alright. So now we got that out of the way. So I've explained to you guys how to get rid of that turbo boost. That's going to fix, you know, research it online and type it into YouTube. That's what I did. And it'll come up. You can uh, research on how to do it. Get rid of it all. Get rid of all traces of it if you can. 
It's crazy, though. You get rid of this stuff. This one keeps coming back for some reason. So I think when you get an update, it puts it back on there. So you have to kind of, you got to watch it. And the best way to tell if it's, if it's running or not, sort of make sure it's not running. I don't want it on my machine, but it could be on your machine as long as it's not running. So you want to go in here and you want to go, let's make sure, yeah. So it's not running. That's the most important thing right here. And it's not in our startup. So you just want to make sure that it's not running. So check your task manager. Make sure that that thing's not running. And then your machine st should be a lot more stable. I have not had a blue screen since I did that. And I've really been torture testing this machine too. Um, I had a, a session in um, Studio One. It was this one, I think. Put this in record mode. Uh, if I play this... It's going to load this processor really heavy, like 100%. Okay, we're at 99. There's 100. The light's even on. But notice, no dropouts. There might be just a few little ones. Okay. But what's crazy is... Try this in Pro Tools. Screen redraws, click on stuff, open, close. I mean, everything's snappy, everything moves around like it's supposed to. I can even, and I don't, I don't recommend this, but let's leave this running. Let's do that and we'll start Premiere Pro. And I'm not even scared. starts up I can even edit a video at the same time that's playing okay we can get rid of that this is still look 100% for me it was really important to get my system stable um, that's even more important to me than speed speed is nice don't get me wrong I like it to be fast and snappy. Everybody does. We want to get this done quick. We want to work quickly while we're creative. More important than that is stability. I'll give up some speed for stability. I feel like I don't have to now. I've got it running very stable. Very stable. So, you know, not only I have, I got this open to record my video. I've got Studio One open. I've got this little program that shows my temperatures and my voltages and everything. Okay, let's make sure everybody understands what's happening with this dropout protection, okay? When this is set to minimum, it means that every track on here is going to run at 128, which is what you would expect, okay? That's normal behavior. However, when we move this to maximum, you see this buffer move up to 2048. What that's telling you is when we're at maximum, every track that is in playback mode, okay, here's the key, playback mode, which means it's not record enabled. This track here is record enabled. This track is going to run at the minimum dropout protection or buffer, okay? It's gonna run at the minimum buffer setting just for this track though, just for this one instrument, okay? All the rest of these are gonna play back at the maximum buffer setting, a 2048, okay? Is everybody follow me? So the one that you have record enabled is gonna go low latency and the remaining tracks that are on playback are going to play back at the higher buffer setting, okay, at the same time. So let's do that. We play it. Okay, let's go back to minimum. I want to show you guys something. So, because I saw another guy do this. He was wondering what was causing his high CPU usage, even though he was on maximum dropout protection. And I'll show you why. 
So if we go to minimum right now and we play it. Okay, let it load up some polyphony. Here it comes. It's gonna start dropping. Okay, here are the dropouts. Got audio dropouts, right? Look, we've got this record enabled, right? If I unrecord enable it, it doesn't do anything. It stays exactly the same. If I play it, we're still gonna get dropouts. We're still at 80%. It doesn't go up, okay? It doesn't go up when I record enable any of these. The CPU doesn't go up on the instrument uh, when it's record enabled. Why? Because we're in minimum dropout protection. So everything in the project is going to play back in 128 samples because we're on minimum. Remember, minimum, buffer, okay? 128 samples, everything. So that's going to give us the dropouts. And if I record enable, it doesn't change, okay? And this is the key. This is, this is the key you got to remember. When I record enable this, it puts this one track into minimum and again we're gonna look at it I'll show you guys whoop I'll show you how to find it this whenever you have a green button that is saying that hey that's in low latency mode and if you play it it will play great it's very low latency if we turn this off and play it the CPU is going to go down. Okay. But we've got massive latency now. Turn that back on. It's going to go up. It's okay though. This is perfectly fine. If we're in record mode, let's say we're going to record this part in. Okay, it's going to go high. It may even start to have dropouts. We could be having them. We don't. We don't hear them, but it's maxed at a hundred percent. Now, when you're done playing your part in, take it out of record mode, and this is the part that I see people not doing. Okay, by default, uh, when you select a track, Studio One is going to go ahead and record enable that. So when you go to this one, it'll automatically do that. I have that turned off. And the reason is, I don't want it, when I click on something, I don't want that to go into record enable because that's going to bring my CPU up. If I'm not paying attention, I'm going to forget about it. And look what we have all of a sudden. Yeah, we're going to have craziness. Yeah. See? That's really bad. So take it out of record mode, it pushes everything back to the same buffer. Now what's amazing to me is uh, how they achieve this. Um, you have two different buffers going at the same time, yet they're still in perfect alignment. That's the key. Maybe, maybe a lot of DAWs do this, but I don't know. It, I, it's awesome. Because back before they had this, um, it was kind of standard practice when you ran out of CPU power, uh, the first thing you might reach for would be the buffer and your audio interface. I like to find kind of a happy medium in, I like to, a low enough buffer setting that it feels good to play, but not so low that it taxes my computer after four instances of something. So let's look at the other ways we can get back some CPU power, okay? The first thing we should do when we see a session that is maxing out our CPU, I got this on a loop now, and we've muted the audio. We don't need to hear it. Um, you can see what's happening. The CPU is way high, okay? The first thing you want to do is look at this Show Devices panel here. And you're going to notice, the first thing is, I have the CTC1 on, and that's a, that's a mix effect. And I can show that here. That's this guy, right? And this is a console emulation. I like the way it sounds, so I have it turned on. 
So I'll let you hear it. First thing we can do is just turn that off. Okay, why is this one so high? This one's at 70% and the rest of these are about 40%. So that's a red flag right there. So click it. First thing I'm gonna do is click it. Take a look around. Well, first thing I notice is multi-core is not turned on. Turn that on. Now what is it at? Ah, now it brought it down to match the other ones. So they should all be sitting around 40% which they are now they're all even but look how much that brought our CPU down by that took our CPU down like 30 percent right there and that's just something I forgot to do I pulled it up and I went hey ooh, I forgot to turn the multi-core button on this is common this happens so it's it's great that we have this tool in studio one where we can look at the devices and see which one is the biggest offender okay so now I've got all these equaled out but I think we can do even better. One of the other things we can look at here is voices. I know that if I click on this part that I only, I'm only using four notes of polyphony here. One, two, three, four. Only four notes at any given time, okay? That this particular VST bases its CPU usage off of how many voices you're using. So if this is set to eight, it's gonna use all eight voices whether you're playing one note or eight notes, it's the same. So I know we're only using four notes of polyphony, so let's drop this down to four notes. And let's go to the next one. Run him to four notes. Next one. Run him to four notes. Next one. Okay, down the line. So. Now we've got all the repros just using four notes. Let's see what that does. Wow, we were peaking at 70%. Now we've got it down to 22%. So even with the console emulation turned on, now we're at 30%. Whereas before, when we started, we couldn't even play this thing. For you want to look at your, your VST instruments and go under the hood and check the settings. And you want to make those settings the best they can be there is another one here. So we'll look in the settings, preferences. Uh, look at this, multi-core threads, right? Hey man, I can use eight. It's set to four right now. So let's change that on every instance. Now let's play it again. What did we gain? We gained two more, ah, no we didn't. <laughs> we didn't gain anything. We didn't gain anything by that. Okay, that was a waste of time. Uh, did we gain anything? I don't know. We got these things down to 21%. So those are the not so obvious things to look for. Look in the settings of your instruments. So we just looked at one, but go through them all and look under the hood. There's, there might be some settings that you don't know about that will make it run more efficient. Okay. So let's look at some of the other things, the obvious things that people do, for sure. Transform to audio track. Okay. That's the first one, right? All right. So we converted a few of those to audio, and if we play it back now, look what we get. Would you look at that? So you can go through the whole session and do that. And then the nice thing about doing it this way is when you want to convert it back, set up a key command, boom, turn it back. Watch this. Boom, that fast. There's a few reasons why you would still want to bounce everything to audio. Number one is, you know, if plugins don't work, the manufacturers uh, fade away, operating systems change. You know, in four or five years, these plugins might not even work. You know, look at Alchemy. Nobody saw that one coming. So you just have to do what works best for you. And for me, I try to keep everything in MIDI for as long as possible. It's just, it's easier to work. It takes less time. Uh, I can just continue to work through it, get through it really quick. Sometimes I'll print things to audio because it's easier to work on in audio. Um, drums, percussion, a lot of times depends if I'm making sound effect there's a there's a lot of reasons I use 
audio, okay? Sometimes I want to throw into a sampler. So all those kind of things. But if you're just playing the instrument as is through the song, there is no reason to convert it. Till the very end if you want to. Um, a lot of people mix as you go. I tend to mix as I go. Um, and depends on the project. If it comes out good, I'll roll with it. If it's just horrible and I'm not getting it, I'll print everything to audio, bring all those files back into a brand new, fresh session, and pull all the faders down to zero, and start from scratch. And have a different mindset and everything. And then I can usually get my mix to work after that. But um, I don't always do that. So you got to decide how you want to work. And just work that way. I hope this information helps some of you guys. So the next video is going to be the computer. And we'll finally get to it and see what it is and all that good stuff. Okay? Till next time. Later.